Okay, let's go on. Our next uh, speaker for today is Miloš Milovanović, and um, he will talk about um, a very Hello. interesting topic. Hello, Miloš. Welcome to HIPCON. Thank you. So we all know that software development process can be very stressful in a fast-paced environment, and exactly. Miloš will cover exactly that topic, how to build efficient engineering teams, right? Yes, yes that's right. Okay. Thank you. The floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, hello, everybody. Just a quick check. Uh, is there anyone in the audience who does not understand Serbian? Okay, that is more than zero, so we'll continue in English. Okay, so hello, everyone. My name is uh, Miloš, and uh, I'm a software engineer. I started working in Nutanix this year. Before that, I worked for, for Microsoft here from Belgrade for uh, nine years. So. I have uh, more than a decade in building uh, uh, world scale and world class uh, services. So I have learned uh, many things on that journey and now I would like to share that with you. And moreover, even before Microsoft, I have more than another decade of working in software industry in uh, several smaller companies. I was in academia, I was in uh, I was te teaching assistant in the Faculty of Electrical Engineering. I was studying abroad. So uh, I really think uh, I, I worked in, in many environments and uh, I was able to um, spot something which is uh, not taught at school, but I think it, it's very important and I would like to, to share it with you. Most of the things I, uh, I learned are from my time in Microsoft, but uh, since I joined Nutanix this year, I had the time to, to polish uh, all those concepts, concepts and to extract what is general and uh, I believe can be applied to any service you build. And of course, uh, if, if, you, if you plan to, to, to scale and to have a globally uh, available service, then definitely you need uh, to have something like this. Okay, so... Um, in order to uh, demonstrate and uh, give you an example of what is an engineering system and how it can help, first, I will, I will present uh, our architecture. I don't know if there is a pointer, but nevertheless. So first, I will uh, demonstrate uh, uh, frame architecture. And then I will talk uh, a little bit about the differences between traditional software development cycle and service development cycle and once we cover that topics those topics we will uh, we will see what the engineering system is and how you can build uh, efficient engineering teams around of course i have some slide and i have i have the things to to share but uh, i would like to have the, uh, the interactive session so if you have any questions please stop stop uh, stop me at any time okay so just um, uh, what is frame? So our high-level goal is to be able to, to run any application in, in web browser. So now you ask yourself, uh, why would uh, anyone uh, use that? So there are at least several reasons. So the first one is, imagine there is some uh, old legacy app which was built for, for 20 years and it, it was developed on, on uh, for example, Windows. And there is no way that you just take it and rewrite it and, and ship it to cloud. So there is, there is no way to do that. So Frame can be a solution for, for those problems. And second problem is, imagine, for example, you have some school, and typically, for example, schools in, in, in Serbia, in, in smaller towns, they don't have skilled administrator, administrators to administrate their uh, networks and machines. So they can use such platform to trivially install uh, their labs with any operating system, with uh, Linux, Mac, whatever, and there should be just a web browser and they, they, are, they can stream any application. So this is our goal on top, to have a browser and in it to have an application. So how we do that? First, we leverage the entire infrastructure from major cloud vendors 
Uh, we are completely a uh, cloud-born company, so we don't have our own infrastructure. We have everything in cloud. We will see more details on a, on a following slide. And then on top, we have one small layer, which is platform uh, layer. Why? Uh, for our customers, uh, it is very complex to, to use uh, Amazon or Azure uh, infrastructure directly. So if you, for example, visited uh, Azure or uh, Amazon portal, there you have a million options. And to be able to compose all those services, you need to have, uh, I mean, several years of uh, education in that space. But again, imagine you are a small school somewhere in Serbia, and you simply want to have Windows operating system with an app and to have it for, I don't know, 30 students. And that's it. So we provide such platform where you can very simply click. Here is, for example, our interface. So you can choose. We are not locked to any of uh, major cloud vendors. So our clients can simply say, hey, on your frame platform, we want account to give a name to pick a cloud provider, whichever they, they, they like. AWS is very popular these days, Azure, Google, or any other which might show up in the future. And then they pick a region which is closest to their location, and then they select an image. At the moment, we provide uh, major Windows images, but also Ubuntu and, and CentOS. So once they pick this, they're, they're good to go, and on the next uh, level, they can install their app, and that's it. So pretty simple. We do the rest, and how it is done. This is a frame architecture on a high level. Everything starts with the browser. So this is all you need to, to have on your local machine. So for example, this is Ubuntu. You open your, your Mozilla. You uh, go to our URL, and, and you are done. Everything else happens, uh, happens for you in the back. How it is done? So the first part is if in here. So of course, there is some virtual machine in the cloud. Your app is running there. What we do, we pick up the content of this display, and we stream it to your browser in the same way uh, as when you are watching a movie. So this is H.264 stream. And once you apply some operation on, on a browser side, that will be sent here to the, uh, this machine. It will be applied to this app. And then again, uh, video stream is going there. So from the point of view of, of a customer, this application is running on his or her uh, laptop. And for, uh, for a lot of customers, this is exactly what, what they want. So this is the first, first part of our system, is this video streaming. Of course, the second part is this uh, infrastructure. We call it back plane or control plane. So once you connect to your browser and click on a button and say, hey, I want this app, of course, that request is sent to the back. Those services start working, services which know to talk to the cloud which you selected, start provisioning VM for you, install the app, start the app, and streaming starts. <coughs> so uh, the key to take away from this slide is that this is pretty complex uh, service. Although to your customer it seems pretty trivial, in the back there is a pretty complex system. And in each part of the system, we used appropriate technology. So in the front, we have React and TypeScript. In the back, we have Elixir and Python, because in, in those places, those technologies are, uh, are the perfect fit. And on VMs, we have C Sharp and C++, because those technologies, C++, is good to implement a streaming solution. So. Um, and of course, our goal is to have millions and tens of millions of customers. So this entire uh, 
system has to be built first and then it has to be monitored. So very important part is not just to build, it is relatively easy to build, but eventually you need to, to operate this service. Okay, uh, this is the, per the first part. The second part, um, uh, I would just like to remind you about traditional software development cycle. Why? Because I think that uh, a lot of people still have that, that mindset and, and develop uh, the software in that way. So I will just remind you on that and then we can uh, compare it uh, with the service development cycle so you can make uh, your own conclusions out of that. So let's use an example of SQL Server. This example is dear to my heart since I worked in this company from 2010. And in those years, uh, those are years when, when uh, some version of a SQL Server was uh, released. So in 2000, 2005, 2008, 10, 12, and so on. So what you can see from here is that um, traditional uh, so software was shipped in, let's say, in, in, a, in a couple of years. So development cycle was in years, in the, this case, three years. And if you look code names, those on top, Yukon, Katmai, Kilimanjaro, and Denali, though those were the code names for those projects, which eventually became SQL Server 2050, uh, 2005, 8, and 10. And what are those names? So those names are some of the highest mountain tops uh, in the world. So from this, you, you can see that the mindset at that time was we are building the software as if we are trying to, to conquer some of the highest mountain tops. And immediately you see that mindset is that we will need a couple of years to prepare, do the thing, conquer the thing, and, and then even come back, which is also important thing. And if we double click uh, into traditional software development cycle, we noticed those phases. So the first uh, group of people come and say, hey, let's design and plan our product. Then second group of people come and they build it in, in a whatever way they know. And first phase usually lasts for, let's say, at least if you plan three years, so at least six months you spend on planning, then at least a year you spend on development, and then at least another six months on a year you spend on testing. And once testing is complete and your testers say, hey, yes, this is what we planned two years ago, then you burn it on a CD and ship across the globe. <coughs> And, and th this was just fine. It worked for years. But wh what is the biggest problem? The biggest problem is that this cycle is too long. So from the moment you, you start designing and having the idea till the moment your customers will see that software and uh, start using it and start providing you feedback, it was three or four years. So that was too slow. And what is especially problematic Especially problematic is what we call today unknown unknown. So what is that? Uh, people usually, they plan for the things they know. But we all know that every project will hit some point where you, where you uh, encounter something you didn't plan. And even worse thing is you, you encounter it, you didn't plan and you don't know how to solve it. So that is unknown unknown. And here is the example. Very trivial. Imagine you started your software and, and you, you had to build this function on the domain from 0 to 100, and your best developer implemented it in this way. So completely optimal implementation for this function. But imagine after six months you have a requirement to run this function on domain from 0 to 1,000, and you ask your developer, hey, uh, would our software work on a domain from 0 to 1,000? And developer will say, yes, sure. And then after another six months, you get another requirement to run this function on domain from 0 to 10,000. But your developer uh, went to some other company or to, to other uh, uh, team. And you look back and say, hey, this was the best developer. Uh, when I asked him last time whether we can increase domain, he said, yes, sure. 
So probably we can increase it again. Software is working great. And let's test it. So you start testing. Let's try with 10,000. This works. Let's try with 5,000. This works. Let's try with 2, with 7. It works. You said, great. OK, let's ship this code from a domain from 0 to 10,000. And of course, you get this. Everything will work great until somebody hit this uh, combination, which doesn't work. And of course, nobody will use this function directly. That function will be used in combination with, with other things. And you get a uh, uh, possibility that your customers, this will, this, will, this will cause a crash. And in traditional cycle, you spend three years building it, then six months somebody tries to use it and then hit this crash and he or she need to wait months for this to be fixed. Okay, obviously not good. Software as a service, so how that appeared? Uh, of course, internet improved significantly over the last decades, and there is, there is no need for you to, to burn CD and then ship CD via truck or, or boat. You can now ship your software uh, over internet. And what does it mean? You can deploy in minutes. You don't need to wait for a truck to, to travel on the other side of the world to uh, distribute your software. You can do it in minutes. And more importantly, you can start collecting feedback from uh, the usage of your software in minutes. And what is the implication? Development cycle is not years anymore. It is now months or even weeks. People deploy now in weeks. And you guess what? That problem from the traditional cycle where you have bugs is not going away. Just you will have bugs deployed faster. So you need to do something about it. OK. Here is the service development cycle. Uh, now we try to build, measure, and learn all the time. So this, this, this is what we do. And why it is done this way? Of course, when the bug from the previous slide happens, you want to be able to, to spot it and learn what happened and then fix it and then iterate a couple of times. And why is that important? You want to spot this before your, your competition. Why? Here is the example. Imagine you're building uh, this park, and you have a beautiful design. Everything is great, but your customers are using it in this way. In a physical world, this is OK. So we have a lot of examples in Belgrade. You have parks which are, we will say, customers are not good, and nobody cares. But in, in virtual world, if you build a service in this way, immediately, your competition will see this and build equivalent solution, which will be just plain green field with one lane, and all your customers will go to your competition. So this is why it is important to build service in cycles and spot issues as fast as possible, ideally before customers and before competition. OK, H how we do that? Uh, the key concept is telemetry. Uh, what is telemetry? That is something which is not invented by software engineers. It was invented even before. So for example, biologists, when they study wild animals like alligators, bears, or whatever, so they cannot swim next to them and, and check what, what they do. Uh, instead, they have to put those devices and to emit data, for example, about the location, where, about trajectory. And that data was known as telemetry. We need exactly the same thing. So if you remember architecture I showed in previous slides, so we have uh, virtual machines across the globe. So we cannot go, for example, if there is a problem in Japan, we go to Japan to, to check what, what is there. The only tool we have is telemetry and to send data in some big data storage and then to check uh, what is happening. Here are examples. For example, customer clicks. So we have many buttons or menu options. So how do we know which one is selected? That is telemetry. 
Uh, second example is uh, response times. So it is not the same if customer clicks a button and the uh, response time is in milliseconds, or it is in, in seconds or even worse if it is in minutes. So if you see that your response time on UI is, is one minute, then you are in trouble. Of course, telemetry is your resource utilization. You need to track how much CPU, memory, I.O., GPU, whatever is, is used and to see whether your service work as expected or somewhere you have too hot nodes and you need to, uh, I mean, uh, put additional replication or whatever. And maybe the most important, you need to track errors, exceptions, et, et cetera. So those you need uh, to monitor uh, very carefully and to react on them proactively. Once you have that data, the data is flowing your way. It's very important that you visualize because you will have a, a lot of data, maybe gigabytes per day. We have 50, 60, 70 uh, gigabytes per day. And you need to visualize. Th that is done, for example, here is the part of the dashboard we use. For example, errors which occurred in last 12 hours. 12, yes, 12 hours. And for example, in this moment, we we seen that some error spiked suddenly. What does it mean? That means that something does not work as expected. There are too many errors. So immediately, somebody from the team has to stop whatever is planned to investigate this case and to fix this case. OK. Now, when we know all of this, now we can talk about the engineering system. So engineering system is a system which should help you to build product or service you want to build. And of course, basic goal is if you have, let's say, a good change, everything is great, you, you want to put some change in your code base, engineering system should help you to uh, deploy that change as fast as possible, ideally in a couple of days or weeks. but. If a change is, is bad, if, if there is a bug in, in whatever sense, engineering system should, should stop your change and tell you, hey, th there is a bug you need to investigate before uh, deploying to production. Uh, so from this slide, you can see why engineering system is important. First, uh, you, uh, you have uh, a limited number of engineers. So for example, 10-ish or uh, maybe a couple of hundreds in Microsoft. Uh, but on the other side, you are trying to build a service which will be used by millions of users. So there is no way that you can say, hey, this is my developer who started working six months ago. He will know all customer use cases. And when he or she change the code base, uh, that will be good. So you need engineering system to help your team to, uh, uh, let's say, at least test whether uh, your change will be good in production or not. So this is in a narrow sense. But as we saw on a previous slide, engineering system in a wider sense does not end when you uh, deploy bits to production. Engineering system is also ends with monitoring behavior in production. And engineering system starts even before you start coding. Engineering system help you prioritize your work. So we will see on the next slide. Uh, imagine you have, for example, three new features you're working on, and suddenly you see spike in uh, three errors in production. So what should you do? Engineering system should help you, and if that spike, for example, impact majority of your production, definitely you should stop working on your new feature and, and look what is happening in production. OK, let's now double click what the engineering system is. And maybe some things are obvious, but I, I want to uh, emphasize them, since many times uh, I, I spotted when, for example, when working with a new team or new engineers, I see that uh, some things are not clear. So in a development phase, of course, first you need to code, then you test, ideally, you should have automated tests, but people skip them. Then you, you have to deploy 
your change to some cluster and then validate change on a cluster. Why I'm em emphasizing that? Because your change is done only in this moment. I've, I've heard many times people say, hey, my change is done when it is coded first time on, on their development machine. And they said, hey, yes, it works for me, let's ship it. You cannot do that. At that point, you can just say, hey, I'm code complete, I did code review. Code review ve is very important, I don't know. Uh, nowadays, people do code reviews, but uh, I've also seen, uh, you know, uh, we have term in Serbia, burazerski, that is like f friendly doing code reviews, like you, know, you send the code review to your friend, and he said, yeah, yeah, this is the best change. So code review is not, not bureaucracy, code review is important thing, it has to be done. Testing, especially automated testing is uh, very important, not only for your change in the development phase, but also we'll see later. So those tests have to be repeated again and again and again, every time in the future until your, your feature is present. And then you need to deploy because your local environment is very different from cluster environment and your change does not mean much until it work on, on, on a cluster with other changes. So that is the first part. Then second part of the engineering system is testing, validation and deployment. And there are several stages. Uh, in my opinion, there should be at least three stages. So the first one is, l let's call it uh, testing and development in a local environment. Then testing and validation on test cluster and stage cluster. And then in the end, ideally, there shouldn't be deployment, but I, I see in deployment in, and testing in production. So uh, why is this split important? In first stages, of course, you have fast uh, iteration cycle. So you can locally change your component, you can test it, it is on your local machine, that is your DLL library, you iterate fast. And why it is important to have those stages? Because if you have a bug in, the, in early stages, that is not, not a problem. But if you have a bug in production, that is very expensive. So the entire point of all of this is uh, to allow you to, to stop propagating bugs as fast as possible. So ideally, you should have phases. First phase, you develop on a local machine. In a second phase, maybe, uh, we call such environment single system image, or in Microsoft, it was known as one box. So that would be a VM with all services, but on one node. So you can quickly iterate. If your change spans several services, you should be able to test all of them on your machine. When that is done, then you go with the cluster validation. Again, ideally, you shouldn't test on clusters where you have customers who are paying you, because obviously, uh, if, if there is a regression, uh, worst thing which can happen is that somebody tweets that, that you have a bug, and that is what you don't want. So you need to have test clusters and stage clusters. And stage cluster should be exactly the same as production cluster, but without customers who are paying. So there you can play around, you can even make mistake. If you make mistake in here, you, you, you can break test of, of your colleague. Okay, you, uh, you buy them coffee or whatever, so it is not a, not a huge uh, problem. And this is the last line where, uh, where l l let's say, cost of a bug is small. When you cross this line, you start deploying to production, and it is always good uh, to split production a bit. So I've seen many systems where uh, deployment uh, affects all customers. So that is, that is not good, because if you have a bug and all customers across globe are affected, uh, that is a big uh, problem. And for example, uh, when I was in Microsoft, so we, we were all afraid that that uh, we, we can lose a job in a single day if there is a, a so severe incident which affects all customers worldwide and if customers lose trust, that is, uh, that is <laughs> end of your business. So it is always good that you split even your customers in production. So the first you upgrade so-called early adapters or 
those are your friendly customers, some internal customers or, or companies uh, which are your uh, friends. And even if you, if you break their bits and their workloads, they will uh, call you and politely tell you that something is not working, but there will be no uh, media and uh, no, no tweets. And if they are OK, then you upgrade majority of customers. And if they are satisfied, then you upgrade your so-called golden customers or premium customers or diamond. And those customers are, are the ones who are actually paying you. So you don't want to uh, break those guys. OK, so there are, there are many things to uh, say about engineering system, but this is at least start. And to be honest with you, uh, Th there is no company in the world uh, which has everything in place so in every stage you run automated tests. But at least that, that should be our mindset and we should try to build something like this. And I'm 100% uh, sure that this will pay off and in, in the long run uh, you will be more successful with, with this. Okay, so when you have this, uh, how do you organize your team? First, you need to handle incidents. I mean, that, that's obvious. I wouldn't uh, spend much time on it. I don't have it. <laughs> the second thing is you need to monitor your production. I've seen many times people start developing new features, and they don't care what is happening in production. Uh, you, you can lose your business uh, if, if your current customers are not happy and start tweeting that your system is not working. Nobody will care about the new feature. So. It's absolutely critical that you monitor what is happening in production. And if something is not happening as it should be, you need to fix it immediately. Why? Because many customers will not call you and, and say, hey, there is an incident. They, they, they would just leave your platform. So it is extremely critical that you first do monitoring before starting de developing new feature. And just the last hint, when you start developing a new feature, start with telemetry. I've seen many times people spend months and months and deploy in production, deploy in production, and when I ask them, okay, what is happening in production, they don't know. So the first thing you need to do is to start with, with telemetry. So if you have a new feature, a new button, at least put a signal uh, whether somebody clicked that or not. You will have a simple signal if nobody clicks there, you maybe even don't need to, to do that feature anymore. And if people click on it frequently, then probably you need to put more, more guys on, uh, uh, on, on developing that feature. And of course, have in mind, build, measure, learn, iterate, and uh, that, that should be the recipe for success in a service world. Thank you. We are hiring. Thank you, Milos. Any questions for Milos? I see him in here. Question? No. OK. No? OK. Milos okay. will be around, so feel free yes, to Yes, you can up. stop by. We have a boat down there. Exactly. See you in five minutes, Th There guys. is one question. Oh, there is one question over there. Sorry. Uh, what are the tools you suggest we use for telemetry in general? Uh, well, uh, there, there are several uh, uh, tools we use. Uh, we use, uh, historically, we use Logly as a, as, a, as a big data store. And we, we log our telemetry there. And uh, lately, we, st uh, we start moving to, to Splunk, for example. So in short, those are uh, uh, big data stores where you can uh, uh, inject your telemetry and they have a nice tool to build on top of, of that data to build all, all those uh, nice charts. So uh, consider using uh, Splunk or Logly. Thank you. Thank you, Milos.